that comes up. All right, we are live. Good morning, everyone. Uh, here on the East Coast, at least. Welcome to Meet the Master. Tim Watson here with Master, Master Efren Valentin. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Mr. Watson. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for your patience. Um, you know, you've asked me to come on earlier in the year as as uh, did uh, some of the other masters, Master Fairley and some of these, uh, some of the Latin American ones asked me as well. Um, and in full disclosure, it's just, I, 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 at that point, I really felt that some of the questions I wasn't gonna be ready to answer. And I think it was when you were gonna talk about Grandmaster, it just wasn't something I was ready to talk about just yet. And it's been a year and it's been a year of healing and. And all that, so I think we're I'm, a, I'm more prepared now than I than I was in the, before. So thanks for your patience. Absolutely, I, and I appreciate your honesty, and uh, you know, obviously respect that, and completely understand, uh, you know, where you were coming from. Because listening to your interviews with Dan and, and talking to you, you know, you lost some you lost a part of your family. So I I, I totally understand that. Yeah, and you know what? One of the biggest things is you know, so I'm going to take the lead on this for a second. Was that um. Um, I had a difficult time um, understanding why um, or why the, his loss was more because I it was it bothered me more than my grandparents it bothered me more than some of my cousins that I've lost and family members and I felt guilt out of that and it, you know so I ended up having to to talk those problems out you know with a uh, with, with, with a specialist that deals with this with grief counseling and. Uh, and uh, so, you know, it, it was part of my healing was to start off with a uh, deal grief counseling. And the only reason I mentioned that's because, you know, sometimes we're big and some people look us to be big, bad masters, like the picture that you got of me. Okay. But it's important that, you know, we all get help when we think that we need help. And I was at a point where I just couldn't understand that. And I had to come to acceptance. Of course, my wife said, I was telling you forever that he was a mentor. He's a big part of your life. It's okay. Uh, and then, of course, she said you had to pay somebody to, to tell you the same thing that I told you. Well, you know how that works. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I uh, I just did an article for uh, a newsletter, and I mentioned something that Master Khan said to me that really, really kind of stuck with me. Where he said his daughter always called him, you know, our legend, and he's like, I'm not a legend. I'm just a normal guy, and you know. It, I, I like that you said that because like you said, sometimes, and I'll, I'll share, I'll share a story of when I first kind of saw you. You, you, you build up people in your head. Uh, and so I appreciate, like you said, um, sharing and being able to let people know that you felt that way. Yeah. 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 And, and it is because, you know, people think that, uh, you know, my God, it's, uh, am I weak for asking for help? And the answer is no, you're not weak. I said, you're weak when you don't ask for help. You know, so you should ask for help when you, you know, it helped me a process. And you're right. Ambassador Khan's daughters do call him the legend. <laughs> and he said he's going to be watching along. He just sent me a message uh, a few minutes ago. Okay, great. He's not a Facebook guy, but. Uh, his yeah. wife, is. you'll have to watch with his wife. <laughs> he'll, send me, he'll send me messages on WhatsApp. So a lot of people yeah. saying hi, uh, chiming in. Uh, speaking of the UK and Great Britain. Natalie Walker and uh, Lindsay, who they pretty much watch every episode of, of this that I do. Uh, we got Tom Lyons saying good morning. Brian good morning. down from Florida. Mr. Bracco saying good morning. Master good morning. Marty. Uh, let's see, Master Marco from Sweden. He's always on as well. Absolutely. <laughs> Master Chapel's in the house. Um, I love, it. it always makes me happy when I see Master McCarty watching along because when I think of like martial arts historians, like that's the guy I think of. <laughs> yep, absolutely, absolutely. So I I am looking at the screen as well. So thank you, Daniel Jordan. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Jordan says he's looking forward to us. I hope I don't disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> Master Fairley's watching. He said he's going to do his best to uh, to watch for the first part. Yeah, no, everyone's got a day job, so we get it. That's right. <laughs> so uh, where where do you want to start, sir? Do you want to start with? You know what's going on as far as the the project with Bowdoin Academy. Sure. Let let let's start off with. Well, you know what? Can we do say that for the end? Okay. Only because, only because then I'm going to do a little something to have a little bit of fun. So yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that towards the end. <laughs> okay. So, you know, I, I watched the, the the interview with Master Fairley and listening to your uh, your story. And could you tell us 
Let's just start with how, how'd you get started in the martial arts? Well, I'm not sure if you guys could tell, but I'm vertically challenged. <laughs> and being on a vertically challenged part uh, meant that you got picked on a lot. So as I was get picked on, I just say, well, you know what? It, it was just kind of no fun. And, and I was watching, you know, Bruce Lee movies. And, uh, and I thought like Bruce Lee was super, you know, badass. Uh, a disclaimer, sorry if I said badass. Uh, but uh, he was pretty badass. So, and then um, my uncle started uh, training us on my father's front lawn. So this was 1976. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we started training on front lawn and uh, the, my father put a kibosh there after about one, about the spring and summer season because we killed his grass. So, uh, <laughs> so he said, okay, time for you to enroll in the school. And that's when I enrolled at the Academy of Karate in Merit. It was called the Meriden Academy of Karate at that point. So that was 1977 when I when I got enrolled in the, into the studio. So, you know, when I first started the martial arts, I had a friend, Master Priest was doing karate already. So I just took class with him. I didn't knew nothing about it. Was was it the same way or did you have a reference that of, of Master Bodwin at that point or? No, oh, no reference of Master Bodwin. What was is uh, they used to have like these little green stamps um, and, and the green stamp booklet came uh, a month of karate lessons. So my father said, well, here's a free month of karate lesson. We'll see if it's worth it. So then we went, we took the class down. And, uh, and uh, I remember them thinking, they tried really hard to convince my dad because they thought I was Asian. So they said, oh, we got to get an Asian kid in the school. This would be good for business, you know? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, it, by the time they realized I was Latino, it was too late. I was already in the school. <laughs> but yeah, I remember 20, it was $25 a month to take classes. And my father was only making $5 an hour at that time. So it was like, so he, my father let me know, I got to work five hours a week, you know, a month for you to take karate classes, goes right to your karate class. So, so it was basically don't screw around, get ready to work and do what you need to do. And we did. So how, how old were you at that point? I was eight years old at, when I enrolled. I was eight years old when I enrolled. Yeah. Yeah. I, I feel like sometimes it would be nice for and I don't know how, how kids <laughs> will respond to that and be like, tell for their, their parents to tell them like, look, this is what I'm paying for you to be here. So let's, let's be a little more serious. <laughs> oh, you know, I think it's an important trait. I think my father was, uh, you know, we came from a single household. Uh, I mean, I'm not a single working household. My father, right. my mom was a homemaker. She stayed home. I have seven sisters and a brother. So I come from a large family. And uh, so my mom's job was to stay home. And speaking of large families, we, we might have a special guest because I see somebody waking up right now. So uh, we'll, we'll, we'll bring her in the camera up pretty soon. I'm going to leave her be for the time being. But um, so, yeah, I think it's important to tell everybody, hey, you know, nothing wrong with just like putting it in their face, but just like saying, hey, listen, we should be serious about what the investment that we're making. And in my belief, everyone should be doing Tung Sudo, just like everyone's got to brush their teeth and everybody's got to take a bath and your kids don't want to do that. So who cares if they want to quit? People ask me this, how, how come my kids made all the kids made it a black belt? I didn't give them a choice. I go, I go, you give them a choice. I said, you know, they could do anything else, but they got to train. Training's part is what we do. It's, it's part of this. I'm not going to talk to Tim about, Tim, you need to, we're going to teach you about perseverance. We're going to talk about domino spirit. We're going to have a no, a no quit attitude. And then my kids are going to be off doing running around quitting. That's not how it works. So anyway. I, uh, <laughs> I, I agree 100%. <laughs> Obviously, we're a 100% martial arts family. So I, I, I am with you on that. And it's probably a little harder for you with all the kids that you have in the family. But <laughs> yes, I come from a large family and therefore I have a large family. So I have seven sons, two daughters, three grandkids. One of my granddaughters is here actually with me right now. She's not fussing yet, but I'm sure before the end of the interview, she'll be in my lap uh, because uh, I am babysitting while mom is signing up for classes. That's awesome. So we talked about uh, Master Khan. Master D is uh, chiming in. She's like, we're watching. We love Master Valentin. Uh, Master Chapel says he is honored to see his pickup picture up in the background back there. It is. It is right back there. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's part of our wall. It's part of what we do to honor a little uh, grandmaster Baldwin. So we'll just talk about the wall since we're on the wall right now. So the wall was, I had, uh, when grandmaster was, uh, became ill, I had a mark, I had a artist that was in here doing uh, work on my windows. And I'm just going to turn this around real quick. Hopefully nobody gets dizzy so that you can see there, it'll say Tung Sudo 
and and uh, you know there's Valentin karate. So it's a, we gave it more like a like a like a K town Korean town look. So we you know the artist was from Compton. Uh, California. So he goes, yeah, hey, we can make it look like a real K-Town. I said, oh, good. You got experience with that? He goes, yeah, I do it all the time. And then this was going to be our logo. And then Grandmaster got sick and he passed. Um, so we said, well, you know what? I just couldn't. I just, he goes, he goes do you want to change that? Because he saw how much it was bothering me. I said, yeah. He goes, he goes, what do you want? I said, I don't know what I want. I just want to make sure I want everyone to remember. Him. I said, his belt. So we did his belt and we tied his belt up. He kind of like tried to follow a little bit of what he saw from Jordan's picture up in there. Jordan's picture is a lot nicer. And uh, we got the tongue sudo. We got his belt that he was supposed to get at the World 2020. And one of his ba most common things that he would say, my greatest privilege as grandmaster is to serve. You know, he really thought that that was a, it was a privilege. And as grandmaster, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to serve. He wanted to serve everybody, the organization, the association, and serve us. So yeah. I, Going back to a question, no, I didn't realize what I was stepping into when I joined the Marin Academy of Karate. I, it was a, a it was a leap of faith, and it was a good luck on my parents' part. There was a judo school across the street, so it was either judo or karate. I'm glad they chose karate. Hey, it's it's all about you know you, you got to put your name out, and then just that little that little booklet that changed that changed your life. <laughs> it, did. it changed my life absolutely. That's amazing. Um, so. You talked with Dan where you got your black belt under the Mudaquan. Correct. Did you have uh, like a sense of what the Mudaquan was uh, back then? No, I was a kid. You know, I, I, I went down to, uh, I was 11 years old. I was testing for, I went to Springfield, New Jersey, because that's where headquarters was at the time. And I, we tested at headquarters. So I was lucky enough that I got a chance to test in front of Grandmaster Wong Ki, H.C. Uh, Wong, and, and, uh, and a bunch of the other Koreans. And, Master Grandmaster Baldwin was part of the committee as well. He was a master that sat on a test board. So it was all masters sitting on the test boards. You know, you had Grand, you know, Master Wan Key, you know, and there was like, there was five, four of us, four kids that were, that were actually testing for, for black belts. Everybody else were, were adults. So we were like, and everybody else, the other three were from, were from uh, the uh, uh, headquarters school. Um, so it was like, you know, the, the old Shin Karate then, it was them, they were testing. So I was the only, foreigner that was coming in because they were all Asian okay so um so the, you know they kind of they were kind of looking at it like okay what are you going to do what are you going to do so I, I I guess I held my own because I passed the test wow Master Khan sending me pictures let's see if I can pull this up here real quick well, on whatsapp so while you're doing that good morning Pam yeah <laughs> that's Master Tolderlin Grandmaster Bodwin yeah yeah that's an old picture Master T's on the other side we were that on the, the other side there. That's Master T on the other side, right there. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, give me a second. We knew this was gonna happen. Okay. Okay. While he's doing that, I just want to thank everyone for watching. If you have anything that uh, you want Master Valentin to uh, any questions, just let us know. Shoot us a, a, a message in the comments. So we let us introduce for the first time to meet the masters, a baby on someone's lap. That's right. Yeah. So here we go. We have Eliana Ray. This is our granddaughter, our oh, youngest granddaughter. Look at that hair. Yeah, she, yeah. I'm sure uh, there's certain masters that are a little jealous about the hair. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Ma Master Four, uh, Jim is saying hello. Good morning. <laughs> hello, sir. How are you? Good evening. Greetings from Seychelles. We loved his, uh, the, we learned a lot about the, the Seychelles, a beautiful place. Beautiful place. I'd love to visit someday. Yes, absolutely. There's talking with all these people. There's, there's a, there's a, I had a list of places that I wanted to go. Now my list is much longer. Yes. <laughs> so you mentioned the Marinette Academy of Karate. How many, how many studios were there under uh, Master Bodwin at that point? It, it's funny because just about every school in the area was called at one point Academy of Karate. Like uh, Porco's was an Academy of Karate, so it's Porco's Academy of Karate. Uh, Master Haney had the Haney Academy of Karate. Um, there was West Haven Academy of Karate. So, and then they were part of the organization under Grand, under Master Bowden for a while when they were all in the Mudaquan. Uh, so, like uh, it just it can, that was it. They were really Academy of Karate. So there's a lot of branches, um, but so there were a lot, a really you know, you know, probably too many to to, to 
to name, but I know like at the, uh, for Grandmaster Studio, he had like, I personally trained in four of three of his locations, three of his locations, one, two, three, three, three of his locations before he settled in on the one that, where they are right now. And we'll talk about that fundraiser. Yeah, and so that was a, when was that? That was like 19, like 85, 86, was it somewhere in that, that time? Oh, eight, eight, early in the 80s. Yeah, early, mid, uh, mid 70s. In the 70s, I, we were training with him. We were training with him on Tuesday nights. So, you know, Tuesday nights, all the black folks would go and train with him. And it was black folk class was on Tuesday nights. Yeah, that's the reason that I have my black folk classes on Tuesday nights, because that's how I grew up. You know, we also have Saturday morning ones, but Tuesday nights has always been a thing. That's what we used to train with him. Uh, so it always gave a chance for all the academy, different academy instructors and black folk to come and train together. So we got to know everybody, even though they were in Waterbury, somewhere in Oxford, somewhere in Newtown and different parts of the world. So, yeah. Yeah. So it was pretty cool. That's cool. Um, I think Master McCarty mentioned this when he did his interview. Uh, when the World Tongue Sudo Association started, uh, Grandmaster Bowen didn't originally bring his students over. Is that correct? correct. That is correct. Correct. So what we did is, uh, you know, I, 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 there was a lot of political things that were going on at that time, you know. Um, so I didn't, I, I, Grandmaster did what every good instructor does. You shield everybody from that. So we, I had no idea. I just, one day, my instructor comes in, says, take off that patch and put this patch on. And I'm like, but I like this patch. <laughs> and, they're, and they're like, so yeah, you're not wearing that patch, you're wearing this patch. So then we were wearing the, uh, we went from the, the Federation patch to the Academy of Karate red patch. And you'll see some pictures there of the red patches. Uh, so we wore that for a while. And then I think it was like, so um, Master Adams and Grandmaster Baldwin and some of the senior masters, like they were part of the, they were part of the whole thing. Ooh, bless you. Um, but everybody else, everybody else was not. Uh, we kind of stayed back. And I think it was like more like 1984 was when uh, I remember um, submitting my certificate, my Muda Kwan certificate, and then uh, getting a uh, World Tongue Sudo certificate for Edon. So I was an Edon. Uh oh, uh oh, <laughs> yeah. And hey, she she lasted almost twenty minutes. <laughs> Listen, I knew it. I knew that this was going to happen sooner or later. Like I said, my daughter in law is signing up for classes, and I did not have the heart to say to her, "No, I couldn't watch the baby." So. <laughs> um, I got some questions coming in. So Tom Lyons asked. Uh, well, uh, about a Master Haney story. And then as Dan actually said, it's his birthday today. It, was Master oh, it is. Yeah, it so. is Master Haney's birthday today. Yeah, we <laughs> cut him cake at our, at our, uh, our black, uh, February uh, black belt test. So, but yeah, it's Master Haney's birthday today. Look at that. Uh, so yeah, Master Haney was an amazing warrior. Um, he, when you grow up, you always have that person that you look up to that you want to be like, like you want to be like Mike, that old commercial, the Gatorade mm -hmm. commercials. I want to be like Master Haney because he was a, he was not only an amazing martial artist, he was an amazing human being. Um, he would just go out, he would give you the shirt off your back, his shirt off his back. And uh, he built my edition on my house and he did it for like cost. Like, and that's how he, it, that was, that's not a Master Valentine story. That's just how he was, you know? And that's the reason that, you know, when, when the man came, you know, he, he never had a lot, but he, he was rich in friendships and, and relationships because of what he had. I mean, it was amazing. So, yeah, Master Haney was like an amazing warrior. He would just beat everybody down and then smile and pick you up. <laughs> never, I never got angry at sparring, you know, but he, boy, he, he was fierce. He was fierce. Fierce competitor. Yeah, if you want to hear some stories about uh, Master Valentin getting yelled at for contact and control, oh, yeah. uh, listen yeah. to his interview with Master Fairley. <laughs> yeah, watch that story if you want to hear about getting yelled at. I got yeah, that's Master Fairley's uh, story right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dovell asks, "Where do your Latin roots come from?" So, mi papá son de Puerto Rico. Ellos, yo, ellos nacieron y criado allá, se casaron y se, y lo, uh, se mudaron acá en el año. 1968, so, so, uh, de, que se y yo so uh, Puerto Rico, uh, my parents uh, moved from Puerto Rico uh, to follow the American dream uh, and, you know, which is, you know, have, give us opportunities. So we were all born here. My parents got married in Puerto Rico, moved down here. Um, my father worked in a, in a manufacturing facility for years until he retired. He worked uh, in the same facility. Um, I get my people say, how do you not stop? I get my work ethic from my father. 
my father would work 12 hour shift in one place and then go work a part-time job someplace else. And on weekends, we were painting um, and, and doing um, uh, work. So I am a licensed plumber by trade. No, I am not coming to do plumbing jobs for you guys, but I will give you advice. I give Grandmaster uh, uh, Shin, I mean, uh, strong advice on whether he should put a garbage disposal in his house or not. So, uh, but uh, anyway, but yeah, so I am a licensed plumber by trade. I keep my license um, just because it's good to have, good to have a backup and you're my backup now. <laughs> it sounds a lot like my dad, I, you know, the, my dad is the, the hardest working guy I ever met in my life. And I got a lot of my, you know, my traits and, and things that I try to instill in my kids from him. So. Absolutely. You know, my brother-in-laws all say that, all say to my sisters that they work harder than they do. And they do because my, all my sisters can outwork my brother-in-laws. <laughs> and because my sisters all did multiple jobs and went to school and do that. And they're like saying, go, and I remember my brother-in-law just arguing one time saying to me, he goes, he goes, you know, she wants me to pick up overtime. He goes, I'm not a balance in. He goes, he goes, 40 hours is enough for me. I don't want to work anymore. <laughs> so I'm, I'm trying hard not to bounce all over the place. Um, sure. I'm going to, I'm going to stay with my questions. Okay. Um, so in 2019, you celebrated like Matt, the Valentin Karate 30th anniversary. Correct. So how did you end up, I'm assuming pretty young, starting your own, your own thing as far as Valentin Karate? That's an interesting story. Well, here's what happened. Uh, get ready for this, guys. So uh, it was um, uh, 1989. I was a Samdan and uh, I had um, broken up with my instructor's sister so after so so i wasn't very popular with him but my classes i was a young hash i remember i was 16 17 years old so when you put my job as a 16 17 year old samdan i just had to teach exciting classes and keep everybody moving i wasn't responsible for business development i wasn't responsible for um uh, uh technical development i was like we just gonna work so my we had like 45 students in the school on when I taught on Mondays, all my classes were packed. So then the, my instructor moved me to Wednesdays because that was a slow day. So guess what? Wednesdays became the busy day. So they followed me. You know, like I said, I had a different role. My role at that time was just to was just to um, was just to uh, uh, you know teach. I had I had uh, I had no responsibility for for achievement. So anyway, so I decided to. Um, I was working as a plumber and I was in the process of doing that. There was a gentleman named Lou Layton who was getting ready to retire. Now I'm 17 years old. I'm his apprentice. And I said, hey to him, I said, hey, you know, Lou, you, got any, you have any regrets? He goes, yeah, I always wanted to join the military. He goes, and I never did. I said, oh, okay. So, you know, but that's me, 17 year old, trying to create small talk with a 65 year old. So he, this, so Lou, this was September. Lou retires in October. November, he gets diagnosed with cancer. February, where I had his funeral. And all I could think about was like, oh boy, you know, this is, uh, he wanted to join the military, join the military. So this was 1988. So I joined the military, went in June of 88, did my reserves, got out, came back to go teach my classes. My instructor said, nah, you were gone for six months, you know, so just take classes over there. So I'm taking classes from Chodons, you know, and Edons, and he wouldn't let me teach. Um, so I just said to him, I, I just felt like I didn't have a place. So he decided, so I decided to, I said, well, you know what? My dad, my dad sees me sulking, you know, he's like, you know, he goes, you gotta stop sulking. Just go and open up your own school. And I said, yeah, but I don't know what to do. So I write, a here's Jill, my office manager just showed up. So she's going to save me. <laughs> Eliana, say bye-bye. Bye. We're going to do the handoff. <laughs> hand okay. oh, pass it by yourself. You have to watch. You have to, yeah, yeah. Okay. So. That was 19, uh, so I come back um, and uh, my father says, just get off your butt and you know, how much money do you have saved? He goes, I got $3,000. He goes, good. He goes, let's go, we're gonna go find you a spot. He goes, okay, your uncle just bought a building. I go, he's got 900 square feet. He goes, the place sucks. It used to be a restaurant, but we're gonna, we're gonna gut it and we're gonna redo it for you. So we gutted it, we redid it. We, we scheduled a date of opening up for June 5th, okay? And we were literally gluing carpets and 10 minutes before we opened up the class. So we had to tell you, right, don't move too much because carpets are still glued down, you know, and, uh, and all that. So I opened a school, I was 19 years old. 
1989, June 5th. And uh, that's when I opened up the studio, June 5th, 1989. And then, but you know, the funny thing is that I, when I wrote a letter to headquarters to open up the studio, you know, I went, the, I said, okay, what do I need to do? Da, da, da. They sent it to the regional director. The regional director at the time was my instructor that I had broken up with his sister. So he goes, oh, you want to open up a school? Why don't you come to me? I said, oh, I didn't know. I, don't, I didn't know how the policies work. So he goes, yeah, here, I'm going to sign off. Go ahead, go do it. You know, and, uh, you know, um, so anyway, I heard some stories of why he let me open up the studio. I think he was, that no one thought a 19 year old was going to be successful. But I used that feeling of people thinking that you can't, that was my fuel to do, to succeed. Okay. So, so when people say you can't, don't believe them. You prove them wrong. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So I started the martial arts, I started in 2001. And I remember in 2002, I started coming to the region eight championships yep. and I would see, you know, I started to realize and understand what a master was. Cause I, my, my instructor wasn't a master at that time. It was master. It was George Maybroda. And then I saw you and I was like, man, that dude's a master. He, he's a, I think you were the fifth, a fifth degree at that point. Probably. I was uh, it's like, holy cow, that dude, he, he's my age. Uh, you're a few years older than me. Um, uh, <laughs> You know, so that was motivating for me and, and seeing guys like you at your age and like Master Fisher, uh, Master DePietro uh, yep. coming up. You know, I started, I was 21, so I was older when I started compared to you. Um, but yeah, for, for me personally, seeing seeing you and guys like uh, you at your age was motivating for me. Well, thank you. You know, uh, so, you know, I think uh, so I was 21 when I tested for Master, so, um, you know, uh, so 21 years old, um, I got the chance to become uh, one of the youngest, the youngest master. The youngest, yes. Not, You're still the youngest master in World Tongue Sudo. Well, I think they put a, they, they have a rule there. They call the 25-year-old the Master Valentin rule. So that when, I guess when Grandmaster Shin didn't like something, he put a rule in there to make sure that it doesn't happen again. So um, yeah, I didn't get promoted the first time. You know, like um, in August, uh, we were, everybody got promoted at the Worlds. Um, and, uh, so I'll share that story because I didn't share that with, uh, yeah. the hands on you. So it was, um, world 1991, uh, 1990, um, 1992, 92, 1992, San Diego. So we were in San Diego, 1992. And uh, you'll appreciate this. Um, I, uh, Grandmaster Bowden is talking to me and he says, you know, you know, Efren, he says, uh, you know, you did a good job and you did a really good job at the test, but it's not always about physical, you know, sometimes you know, they just want to watch, uh, you know, they want to watch how you develop as a person. And, and I can see he's beating around the bush, beating around the bush. And I said, so I'll just make it easy for you. Do my parents have to go to San Diego or not? He goes, because, and he goes, well, um, I said, so I just, I just don't want them buying tickets because my father, it's going to cost them a lot of money to go. And I don't want him going if, if there's no reason for him to go. I said, I'm going to go regardless, but do, do my parents have to go? And he's like, no. So he never said, you're not getting promoted. I just, we didn't officially talk about it. I didn't officially ask him if I was going to get promoted. He just said, you know, it's just Grandmaster Shin. I said, I said, so Grandmaster Shin's like my father. I go, he's old school. I go, and there's a prejudice against sometimes youth, sometimes against women. I get that because they're old school. You got, you got to win them over. I said, I'm okay with it, sir. He goes, well, he goes, are you disappointed? I go, I said, well, it's going to be sad because you're getting promoted that day to a seventh on. So it would have been nice, you know, you know, we would have had that together and my other friends were getting promoted. So, so a bunch of the other people did get promoted Four, four of the seven, uh, uh, four of the eight. Uh, so four of us didn't get promoted. So I wasn't the only guy. There was a, there was a couple other guys that didn't get promoted and, uh, I won't say their names, but I'll give you their initials. Gary Josephic, <laughs> uh, uh, Jesse Dunn <laughs> and Ed Solis. Okay, so those are some old guys, old names right there. So none of us got promoted at that time. So then um, we, uh, so it wasn't like it was just a me thing. Uh, I guess he wanted to see more for some of us. And then we go to the, we go to San Diego. I go test. I mean, we go do the tournament, and he gives me a ring right in front of him because at that time you didn't have no Master Artica, Rich Artica doing ring assignments. It was just like you go here, you go there, you go there. So then I get sent to a ring over there, and they give me all these first dons. They gave me this tall, lanky first Don. We didn't know what he was doing. I think his name was Brian Fisher. Okay. <laughs> so Brian Fisher is one, of, is one of my guys. 
in, in the ring. And of course he goes on to win the cup that year. So I had two of the cup winners were, were the, both cup winners were, were ju judges in my ring. So, and Grandmaster Shin sat there, grabbed his chair, put it in front of me and did this. And just sat there with his arms folded, just watching me, watching me him. And I was like, okay, he wants to see how I do, maybe da, 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 da. So then he was like, okay, boom, boom, takes off, does autographs, comes back, does it again. Later on that night, there's a cruise on the San Diego Bay, sure, uh, uh, San Diego Bay. And um, I was there with my wife and he goes, oh, Efren, you're, you're here. I go, yes, sir. I go, I, yeah, well, Rachel goes, where's baby? Because at that time, JL was a newborn. And, uh, and JL, I think JL was like uh, born in March. So we went in August, but there, dude, there it goes. You know I mean? He was like four or five months old. And, uh, and uh, we left him with my sisters and then we went on this cruise. And, and then I got back um, two weeks later, I get a letter from Grand Minister Shin. Congratulations, you passed the test. Come down to Region 8, Poconos, uh, where I'm gonna promote you there, you know? And I said, okay, so that was it. So that, that was it. So, you know, it's always pretty cool when Grandmaster uh, remembers your name, you know, and, uh, you know, and calls you out. First time I met him was in a Region 8 event at the uh, Black Ball Training Camp. I had just opened up the studio and I'm walking by him. I got my brother, Master O, and I got uh, Mr. Car Carlos, my cousin, and we're at the Black Ball Camp. We don't know anybody. There's like 500 people. That time you only had one camp. And you know, got Master Beam running around and he's yelling at Master Mamitis. But Master Mamitis was, 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 I think, an Edon at the time, but he's, you know, he's getting bullied. Sorry, Master Mamitis, you were getting bullied. Okay. And, uh, and I remember we're in the cafeteria and all of a sudden Grand Master says, Efren. And I said, Huh? Who's calling my name? He goes, Efren. I go, Yes, Valentine, come here. And I says, Okay. So he sits down, You open new school. Go, John. How's it going? I go, Oh, it's going good. I just, it was open two months. But you had to submit paperwork. You had to submit your picture. I had no idea he knew who I was. Because my first meeting with Grandmaster was there. He called me by my name. I come in, I talk to him for a little bit. And then I go back to have lunch with, uh, with my brother and my cousin. They're like, dude, he knows your name. He knows your name. He knows your name. I was like, I know, I know, I know, I know. He's so excited. He goes, yeah, he goes, my God. He goes, isn't that freaking cool? How's it feel? I go, I don't know. I don't know. I can't eat though. <laughs> I couldn't eat. I couldn't eat. Pretty neat. Yeah. So that's the first time I met Grandmaster Shin. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so obviously you early on, you started going to the, the region eight events. Was it just the, the proximity? It was close and it was another chance to train or compete or. Yeah, yeah it was the proximity. It was the uh, master, uh, you know, uh, uh, Haney at the time, Grandmaster said, look, it's, he goes, Let, we need to see how other regions are doing things. So we didn't have a black belt camp, camp at that time, black belt clinic. So we would go there to watch and participate in yours and all that stuff. And listen, it was, and I was a young Samdan, you know, I didn't have a family at the time. So I was just, I wanted to train, train. It was an opportunity to get a chance to train and, and start getting to the old grandmaster, you know, and then, you know, that was 1989. And I remember in 1991, he, he, he asked me to do some traveling with him. So he says, I need you to come to Puerto Rico with me. He goes, um, he goes, uh, I said, okay, sure. And I was like, okay, you know, of course there was no, they paid the ticket. You've got to pay your own way. He goes, he goes, you, but we'll find, we'll stay with somebody there. So you don't have to worry about a hotel. So we paid our own way. Boom. We did training. I served as an interpreter for him. And uh, it was cool. Cause uh, uh, I would go up every year, once a year with him for like four years. And everybody thought I was, I was his son. Okay. And then so I remember one time somebody goes, they go, oh, you go, you know, how, how is it with, you, with, with him being your dad? I go, he's not my dad. I go, he's my teacher. He's my grandmaster. He goes, he's not, he's not your dad. We all thought he was your dad because you've been coming up with him all the time. He goes, nah, he goes, I'm just a Latino guy that gets to hang around with the big boss. So it worked out pretty good. So, you know, that was 91, 92. I tested for my master's belt. Um, 93, he appoints a regional director, not me, not me because I was too young. So Maggie calls me to say, you're not going to be regional director. I just want you to know that he's going to put a Samdan that's going to be regional director. And I was like, okay. And then she's like, you know, you understand? I said, look, I went through this already in 92 and he didn't test me. So of course, 94, he wants to put a new regional director. Of course, it's not going to be me. I'm still, I'm only 23 years old. I get it. So then, um, I mean, it's disappointing because I'm a master and the other guy that was a Samdan, but, uh, but you know, uh, you, you know, you just go roll with the punches. And then, uh, Two years later, that guy didn't do a good job. 
and I get a phone call, hey, we need you to, to take over as regional duties, you're a regional director of, of, uh, of the Caribbean. So, so I remember he called me up, he was like, I, I, I know you maybe get mad at me. And I know I said, no, sir, I wasn't mad at you. He goes, you're not a little mad at me? I says, no, sir, I can't, who could get mad at Grandmaster? I says, I, cause I was disappointed, but I wasn't mad. He goes, good answer. He goes, you're gonna be regional director now. He goes, so your job is to get the next regional director ready. You got four years. So I did. So, you know, and Grandmaster Shin had a vision. He knew four years, we get the next regional director. And then he said in four years, he goes, you got to get this next guy ready. He knew where he had to go, which is he wanted to get the Master Burgess. Okay. And, uh, but he knew that we had to file some, some, uh, this guy, that guy, that girl to this get to Master Burgess. So then, and that's what we did. Master Burgess done an amazing job. You know, I'm ha happy that I get to mentor him and I've worked with him. And, and uh, so this has been one, World Turn Circle has given to me more than I can ever give back. The travel, traveling to the United Kingdom, getting to meet the cons and the amazing family, traveling to Argentina, the Latin Americans. I was regional director of Mexico. I'm going all over the place. But anyway, just, yeah, I mean, World Tung, I can never, uh, I can never give back to World Tung Sudo what World Tung Sudo given to me. Yeah. Uh, Master Khan said that you were the baby master. That's, uh, that was my nickname. Bambino Maestro. That's like the Italians name me, name me Bambino Master. Yeah, that was my name, Baby Master. So, you know, you never would have had the opportunity to do all this training and teaching and going around the world if you didn't have uh, a support at home to do all this. So we haven't talked about Rachel yet. Uh, talk about your amazing, wonderful wife and the fact that you were able to to travel all over the world with little kids at home and you know it, yes i don't know how people who are you know uh, god bless the the family members wives husbands that have uh spouses that are masters and aren't in the martial arts yep um, i don't know how they do it so my heart goes out to you <laughs> It's tough because listen, it's tough sometimes with me and my wife's a martial artist, nice. you know, and, you know, cause I'm trying to juggle the duties of studio work, this work life balance that millennials have created work life <laughs> balance. I go, I see, I have the understanding it, but for me, it's, there's no balance. It's, it's work. I work. That's what I do. Uh, I do have an amazing wife. She's been extremely supportive of me. Um, I will tell you that the day that I, I can, I always know the day that I tested for master's belt. Okay, it was March 26, 1992. Okay, um, uh, 91, 91, 91, 91, 91, 92. No, it was 92. I'm sorry, March 16th, 1992. I, you know, you know, you don't forget moments like that because my son was born that day. So, uh, JL. My wife went into labor the day I was supposed to leave for master's at four o'clock in the morning, her water broke. She wasn't supposed to do it in April. I'm 20 years old, 21 years old, okay? Um, I'm 21 and uh, my, uh, she goes into labor, four o'clock that afternoon, he's born, we have a baby, he's out ready to go and she sees me looking at the time and she says, she goes, well, it looks like you're gonna miss your flight because my flight was at 4.30 and she goes, yeah. So I called Grandmaster Shin. So Grandmaster Shin, you know, Rachel's having a baby. Oh, so yeah, good, good, good. So happy for you. He goes, I see you next year. He goes, I said, well, can I come late? He goes, no, you don't come late. You either come on time or you don't come at all. And I was like, oh man, I thought that was harsh, you know? And uh, so then she said, what do you say? Because he said, well, I either I got to be there before the clinic starts Friday at noon or I can't go. He goes, all right. So, well, do you want to call the travel agent? And I go, well, for what? She goes, do you want to see if you can get a flight? And I was like, uh, sure. Okay, I'll do that. Okay, so then I go, I call the travel agent. I said, oh, good news. I got a flight. She goes, when? At eight o'clock in the morning, boom. She goes, and you'll be, I'll be, I was getting literally changed and I jumped on the floor at 11.59. Grandmaster Strong is checking me in with Grandmaster Baldwin and two hours into the class, of we're working out, and then Grandmaster Shin looks over and says, "Hey, Valentine, when you get here?" And I says, "Sir, I was here on time." He goes, "You have baby at home?" He goes, "Yes, sir." He goes, "And you here?" He goes, "Yeah, Bob, Bob, Valentine here on time?" I says, "Yes, sir." He was here. Then he goes, "Bill, program director, Grandmaster Strong." He goes, "He here on time?" He goes, 
He goes, yes, sir. He was here on time. He, 11, he goes, 11.58. He goes, okay, you stay. Okay, and then I stayed and I, and I took my test. So here's the more of the story. You already know I passed my physical test. As, so I passed my master's test. I failed my test as a husband. Because when my wife said, do you really want, do you want to see, call the travel agent? That was a test. And I chose Tung Soo Do over staying home. My sister, Master Madeline, brought my wife home from the hospital. And uh, Grandmaster Bode, I remember, drove me home, drove me to the house, dropped me off at the house. He goes, okay, go see that beautiful baby. So, you know, yeah, I have an amazing wife because uh, I think most masters would have been killed by that. <laughs> I think master, the only other master that could probably get away with that is Master Khan because Master Dawn is just given, he's another one. She's an amazing spouse that is, I saw your interview with her as well. Uh, but yeah, she's an amazing, she, you know, we're blessed. Khan and me cannot do what we do without the support of our amazing wives. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of like, uh, you know, in every relationship, somebody gets a, somebody, you know, you draw sticks, somebody gets a tall stick, somebody gets a short stick. She got the short end of the deal. She really did. Uh, you know, she's been amazing. She's I blessed. She's a fifth down master. She turned down Grandmaster Shin for testing for fifth down two years in a row before he finally she finally went. Uh, she's turning down her sixth down. Doesn't want to test. You know, she says she says she's not in a place where she wants to go back and she's been eligible for two years. Doesn't want to test. She just says it's important for me to. She's family minded. She wants to work on her family. She still gives back to the studio. She's still here, but just she likes the role of being a grandma. You know, but yeah, amazing wife. Thank you for mentioning her because I, many times I've received awards and in my acceptance speech, one time at the NAACP awards, I thanked everybody but her. <laughs> I thought, you know, so really, I, I, yeah, I'm not as good of a husband as I should be. <laughs> well, she's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so you have, an, how many studios do you have at this point? Is it four? Four, four. We bought one just before the, right before the, the, uh, the uh, <laughs> pandemic hit. We bought it in January. <laughs> oh man! But uh, it's all good. It's all good. We are, you know, we, are, you know, it, we appreciate. You know, it's it, things happen for a reason. We have an amazing team there. Master Perry runs that location. Christopher Perry, I think you know him. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. So I have a great team. You know, I mean, like I'm really don't have to be at the studios anymore. Uh, I just do some of the management. You know, uh, you know, lucky to have my kids involved. Yeah. So you have. Uh... You, you mentioned your your brother Orlando, and then Madeline. They they're running studios too, or well, they ran the they were running the Berlin location for a while. Uh, Orlando's got a new job, so you know, and and my sister Madeline had a baby, you know, so so that kind of like took them out of the picture. So then JL, my son, took that school over when he was a Samdan, and it's really grown under him because he's been like the face, and he's a young guy and all that stuff. So the Berlin schools really excelled there. Uh, and then I basically run the Meriden one with one of my sons and, um, and, uh, uh, and Hiro, I think, you know, Hiro. Okay. Yeah. And then I run, and then the other plants for one is with Christian, my nephew, Christian and, uh, and, uh, Master Hernandez. So those guys helped me run those two locations there. So. That's awesome. It sounds like you have, you're very lucky to have a, a great team around you. <laughs> I have seven sons of the seven sons, six of them are black belts. That's awesome. Uh, the number seven is Gabriel. So Gabriel, you guys have seen around, he's only three and a half years old. I haven't put him in the Tigers program yet because he drives me nuts. So <laughs> I don't want to kill him in class. It's bad for business. <laughs> uh Master Dawn says, I absolutely love you, but got to say, Master Rachel is one in a million. <laughs> yes, she really is. She really is. You know, behind every great person stands there's someone that's in the shadows and that you don't see them you know all the time and they stand back there and they're the you know that's the don cons that's the rachel valentins that's the mrs Baldwin's, that's the mrs strong the mrs shin you know they we get to do what we do because of them you know and i'm you you know, same thing for the, for females that are in, they're in the positions, you know, uh, you know, the, the females have a strong men that are in their lives that allow them the opportunity, you know, to do what they do. So it's important for us to look back and say, thank you, you know, and so thank you, Rachel. Thank you all the women and men that support your spouses, because um, it is sometimes you become a karate widow. Mm -hmm. Master Wheeler says it can be tough, but I include my boo with everything I do. So I see that. 
I see that. Yeah, he, yeah, he does. Master Master Wheeler is one in a million. We, I love him to pieces, and I'm so happy that uh, that he had a chance to test for his fifth on. It's a well deserved, you know. And he's a great leader out there, a great community activist, uh, and that's what World Song Show is about. You take your martial arts, and if you just hold up, and you know, it's good to be a good kicker and a good puncher. He goes, but you have to take that gift, that level of influence. You have to take that, and take it to the next level. You have to be that light beacon that in your in your community and find ways to give back whether it's through like cancer research relay for life the flint water situation you know over there with master wheeler and uh but he's involved in everything giving back to you know things you know we fostered our some of our children and adopted um you know so we take care of foster families my wife sits on a domestic women's domestic abuse of uh board you know it's important to take the gifts that we get through the martial arts uh i'm i was part of the police chief search committee and and meriden and i remember grandmaster bone was like well that's so freaking awesome he goes you know he had to go really he goes he goes he goes he goes yeah he goes look at you're a community person they're coming to you for this and then and you know just i got six months that was a six month process so you know martial arts getting involved to ask to be part of the police chief search committee you know that was a big deal for us um um, you know, so it's important, you know, I mean, take the gifts that you have and, and it doesn't have to be something like just that it could be anything it could be. Um, it could be, uh, you know, you know, just doing a toy drive doing a can drive you can make a, a difference in some in everyone's life you just have to use your gift. Everyone's got the gift you just got to use it. Absolutely. Yeah, we, you know, we do that through many things through uh, giving kids giving kids scholarships I'm sure you've done that throughout the years. Uh, just giving them a place to be that's, you know, that's going to help motivate them and, and put them with people that will make them better. So, man, I can't believe, uh, this is 1147 already. I still got a lot of stuff I want to talk about. Um, so as far as like Connecticut, New England, talk about, we'll, we'll start to talk a little about Grandmaster Bodwin. Um, what is his, what's his legacy I, I, obviously he has a worldwide legacy, but specific to your area, what is his legacy uh, there? And what, what does it mean to you to, to keep that legacy going? Well, it's the, the, the nice thing is, is that I thought I was gonna just be up to me, but I, it's not up to me, it's up to us. The us is the, the family nine. Okay, we, you know, Master Molinero coined that phrase when he got an award. He goes, you know, he goes to me, he goes, he goes, he goes, I don't call you guys region nine, you're family nine. He goes, you're my family. You're from, and I was like, man, that's like a great thing. And I told him, we've ever since he said that, we made that a hashtag and we use that all the time. You know, hashtag family nine, family nine, family nine, because we really are. We're unique in our region that we all get along because not everybody always gets along. And we don't always see eye to eye and, you know, and, and when we don't, you know, we kind of like either get you to conform or you get the heck out of the region, you know? It's not like a boys club, girls club type of thing, but it's like, we're lucky enough that we have all these masters that are a part of it. I get to be his, I am his highest ranking student. I am not his senior student. Master McCarty is a senior student. You know, Master Del Bono is a senior student. You know, Master Haney, those were his senior students, you know? So, and Master Adams who took me in, you know? So those guys were the senior students. Those are the guys that I got a chance to learn from. Uh, there's also other students that are no longer part of the organization that left many years ago, uh, you know, that I still, we still talk. I mean, they still call him my karate father. You know, they give him all the credit. So, I mean, the legacy of Grandmaster Bowden is big in, in New England, big in Connecticut. I mean, uh, he was uh, a father figure, not only to me, but to many kids growing up. Um, he saved a lot of people's lives. He had a kid that came in one time, wanted to learn. He goes, I want to learn how to rip somebody's throat out. He goes, why? He goes, well, my stepdad beats me and I just want to rip his throat out. He goes, okay, but before I teach you that, I got to teach you how to do low block. And then I got to teach you how to punch. And it kept, kept, we kept on delaying it, you know, and he said, okay, you're going to teach me how to rip somebody's throat out. He goes, well, we're not that part yet. We still got to work on this other stuff. So Grandmaster, six months later, the kid forgets why he's there. Mm -hmm. And now he's learning Tung Soo Do and he goes on to become a black belt. Okay. Kid came in there wanting to rip somebody's throat out, but Grandmaster saved his life and changed his life around and got him to forgive it and gave him a safe place. So, so those are that's how we're going to remember Grandmaster. You know, those those moments, those legacies, those opportunities to give back to the community. Um, I mean, 
between Dan and what Anthony are doing to save the Academy. Um, you know, so I, I'm going to go off key here a little bit. So I'm going to just do this. This is not an official World Tongue Siddle event when we talk anything about the Academy. All right. So, you know, I don't want it to, th to think like it's an official event. So therefore, I'm just going to go ahead and I'm going to th make sure my pat my my World Tongue Siddle patch is not on. I love my association, but this is not an official association event. OK, we are going Cobra Kai. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are here to help, you know, the, the fundraising event that Dan and, and, uh, and Anthony are doing is to save the Academy. And, you know, um, we want to save the Academy, we want to try and help it grow. There's different opportunities. Uh, there's a, a, a little bingo event that we're doing. There's like, we had a nice event. We did hundred people in the region. It went so well that we're going to do, we're doing 500 bingo cards, things like that. Hopefully you can share the link a little bit later. Yep. And, and uh, you know, there's uh, so many, I wanna thank everybody that's given to the, to the, uh, the fundraiser so far. Um, you know, whatever you do, it's okay to share, just share it on your personal pages. Uh, and the reason that we have to do that is because World Tongue Siddle is a 501c3 uh, nonprofit. And it can't seem like we're trying to push and solicit money for any particular organization because we're not licensed to do that. So it's just, those are the legal aspects of why we can't do that. Um, and, uh, uh, but it doesn't mean that we're not, World Tongue Siddle is not supporting it because, it, you know, everyone that's put a statement out there said, hey, be careful, be careful. They have also found a way to, to support it on, on their own monetarily. So we thank you guys on your behalf for everything that you guys have done. Uh, so we're excited to share and continue Grandmaster's legacy there. And uh, we can't wait to unveil the school. We're looking for an opening sometime in the early spring. Yeah, that's talking to uh, Dan uh, yesterday, and he was telling me in that like April, May, like somewhere in that time frame, which yep. is, awesome. um, and I've 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 loved having the opportunity to you know share as much as I can, and like you said, um, you know, not officially World Tongue Sudo. My page is not officially a World Tongue Sudo page. I happen to be you know a member, and will be a lifelong member. Uh, and I, I want to support my friends and I do that, you know, that's me. I'm supporting it, you know, not necessarily World Tongue Siddhau. Uh, so I just, we, we just, we're just trying to have the official uh, word that it's not an official event, but thank you everybody in World Tongue Siddhau, outside of World Tongue Siddhau, every, all the martial arts for your support. Yeah, it's been amazing. I, sh I just shared the link for the bingo on the, in the comments as well. Um, you took your uniform off in the background. I see uh, Grandmaster's uniform back there. Yeah, yeah you do. And yeah. Actually, the belt that you took off was his as well, correct? It is. It is. When I got promoted to Six Don, Grandmaster uh, talk, told a story about how Grandmaster Shin gave him his master's belt. So he's, we were at a, comp a tournament, and he's telling the story, and he's, uh, he was getting promoted. It was... It was uh, it was uh, eight, uh, October of 2009. We were at an event tournament and he, he, we knew that he was getting promoted in 2010. And he says to me, he goes, he says that, he goes, I always wanted to do this. He goes, this is my sixth time belt when I received sixth time and I want to give it to Master Allen. He told the story, he, everybody's crying. It was one of those cool things. So, so he gave me this belt. Um, this belt was not given to me by Grandmaster. It was given to me by his wife. So I have all four Grandmaster's Dobox. Uh, I have all his suits as well. So it's funny because Mrs. Bowen did a really good job of like sharing parts and pieces with everybody. Like Dan's got the sword and some things and then he's gonna be in charge of the studio, boom, boom. I got all the uniforms. So I got, you know, all that stuff because I didn't want that to get thrown out. So I said, just make sure you don't throw any of them out. I said, whatever you don't want, let us go through it. So Dan's got a whole bunch of stuff, posters and t-shirts and things like that. And I have some t-shirts. I got the Red Sox hat, his Red Sox hat that I, you know, that he used to wear because we're both Red Sox fans. Uh, no comments about that. Unless you guys, you Yankee fans, I'll kill you. Uh, but um, anyway, so it's nice because I have it. So my plan is to hopefully we, once the Academy is all set up, we'll be able to frame one of Grandmaster's uh, 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 uniforms there uh, and keep it there. But I'm always gonna, I'm always, I, I, keep, an, I keep the one that we wore out of his casket uh, in my office. That one I wanna keep with me because you know, uh, when I'm having a bad day, just somehow I just seem always look to look at the dolog and I just think about him, you know, and just say, okay, well, what would, you know, what would he do? You know, and I try to use that as a guide. We're running out of time. I don't know. How, 
I know you got, you got the the grand the grandbaby, so I want to be uh, you know I, I want to be aware of how long we're doing. Um, a couple a couple quick me messages, and I don't know if these stories are are short or not. But Dan sh asked to share the last tournament uh, story. Your I guess maybe the last time you competed. Oh, is that the? I don't know, Dan. Is that, send me a text. Tell me which one it is. Dan Farrell, he says, "Tell the our last competition story, sir." Our last competition. I don't know. Oh, okay. All right. How about uh, Anthony asked for a Master T story? Uh, Master <laughs> T story. Uh, listen, everything I learned about the birds and the bees, I learned from Master T <laughs> in, in the boys' locker room. Okay. I remember. Listen, he had he had some of the most beautiful girlfriends that would come into the studio, and sometimes two of them would show up at the same time. <laughs> Master T was of the American gigolo. So hey, listen, so we'll leave it at that. Uh, my God, I idolized that. Master T was an amazing martial artist, but he was he had he had the hottest girls come to the studio. <laughs> That's hilarious. Um, are there? Any, I'll send Dan a message. Are there any other things that you, that you want to share before we uh, wrap up? Um, I don't know. Did we cover most of the thing? Let's see. Uh, da, da, da. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's uh, you know, I mean. There's always so much, there's so many stories to tell. You know, there's so many friendships that we've created over the years. Um, it, it, it's, uh, I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for doing this because you do this. And through these video recordings, I did Quanchanim's Corner because I kept on trying to convince Grandmaster Bold. I said, sir, I said, you got a way to reach people. I said, you get excited when you go to a tournament, you do 200 people. I said, we can do that. We could do that from here and you can reach a thousand people. So the first time we did a video and it got 12, I said, look, 1200 people. I go, that's like going to two region eight events. Okay. It's the small events, you know, mm -hmm. um, I says, you know, I go, I go other than that, you know, you have this opportunity to impact. So we started doing those interviews and, uh, you know, I got them to start doing it. And now through this, you're preserving some of the history, even though it's not an official World Tongue Sado page, you're, we got a chance to meet, meet Master Tim Butcher from the UK, Master Khan, uh, Dawn Khan, you got a, you know, the masters from the uh, Seychelles and, and uh, you know, you did a great interview with, uh, Master Debaca, you know, it's always great to hear all these stories. Master Lappin was a good, you know, good one as well. She shared a lot of good information, you know. So, you know, we're getting an opportunity. So thank you, Tim, for doing this and taking this on um, because you are giving time away from your family and things that you can do to go ahead and do that. So thank you. Thank you for, for what you do. Yeah, so there's a lot of good stories. I'll be more than happy to talk to anybody about stories. We'll sit down and when Corona is over and we'll, we'll, we'll talk it up a lot. You know, it I meant I, I meant to mention that earlier. You, you're you're kind of the predecessor of these live interviews with your Sabanim says and and Quanjinim's corner. And uh, before I did the interview with Dan and Anthony, I, I sent you a message. I, I went back and, and looked and watched a number of them. And um, you know, it's it's just nice, like you said, it's nice to see uh, him and hear his voice and and share wisdom. And you still you have that down in video. So like. People that never got a chance to meet him can hear his stories. You, you can get that from, from Grandmaster Shim through stories of other people, but unfortunately there's not a lot of stuff out there on him. So right. to be able to have that opportunity to, to share those stories, uh, you know, through all those masters that you talked about, I, I, you know, that's important to me at this point. I did it at first just, for, you know, because for me, I like learning about martial arts history. I like hearing everyone's stories. But now I realize that, you know, it's 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 fun, but it's also nice to have all that out there. I've almost, almost 50 people I've talked to now. Yeah. Uh, and great, you know, when you did a great job introducing Grandmaster Strong shortly after he had to take the reins. This is not an easy job. Uh, you know, Grandmaster Bowden had big shoes to fill. Grandmaster Strong had big shoes to fill. And he's done an amazing job uh, of leading the organization and leading, leading us to where we need to go. I mean, listen, are, are we, is everything perfect? No. I mean, do, does the executive committee that I get to sit on, uh, do we make everybody happy? No, we don't. I mean, but we're trying to do generally what's best for the organization. We're trying to do what's best uh, for it. I think maybe one day it'd be nice to, you know, have an understanding of what the executive committee, what the governance committee is and how we're trying to lead the organization. So, you know, and, and, and help make good, good, good choices for everybody. But, um, uh, 
but thank you for doing this. You know, thank you everybody for watching. Hopefully I haven't bored you there too much. You know, there's a lot of stories. You can watch master fairly, you know, I'm just one of met masters that have tons of stories, a thing, you know, that to share. Um, so, you know, thank you guys for tuning in and watching. And those of you guys that haven't had an opportunity to do this yet, volunteer a friend, uh, master Tim Watson and say, Hey, yo, I, I'll, I'll give me a shot. He'd love to do that. Yeah. Hey, if anyone is interested, uh, like, <laughs> I, like I said earlier, it, it's usually me. It's like, Hey, does anyone want to do it? And then people be like, Oh, I don't have much of a story to share. Uh, <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, it's not true, but <laughs> well, thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Barbara so much. You know, thank you for those. Those are kind words. Uh, that Brian, you know, they are important for the organization. So thanks so much. Uh, we do appreciate you guys logging in and watching in and sharing all these comments. Th thank you so much. Well, uh, hey, thank you for taking the time out uh, today with me. I really appreciate it. Um, again, if you're interested in helping with uh, the project, like you said, not, not association affiliated, but still a, a very important project in, in Master Valentin's heart and, and mine as well. I sent out the link for the bingo. I'll also put the um, the Indiegogo is done, but is. still We're want to uh, send stuff. I Ma Master Fairly sent me a a thing that has their emails uh, and Venmo information. If anyone didn't get a chance to donate or wants to donate more, uh, <laughs> there is an option out there for that. So, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, peace be with all of you guys. Go out there and you know lead. You know. You know, the, we have some amazing hashtags. One more time, I train, be strong. Okay, those are all. You know, those are and and, and family, our world tongue family. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Take care, guys. Tongue Sue. Tongue Sue, everybody.